I'm Professor Stephen Heppel. I'm a Professor of Learning Innovation in UCJC in Madrid, Fernestias. <laughs> Walking around this uh, glorious school, there are hundreds of reasons why it's exceptional. Well, most of them are smaller wearing green jumpers. <laughs> so the question is, why are the kids so engaged? Why is why is this an outstanding school in terms of what it does? And it's all about the detail. Um, the fabulous staff here have evolved this over a number of years. They didn't just turn up and say, that's how we want it, let's build one. Um, they've evolved it and the, the reaffirmation here is that the detail really matters. None of this is hard, but it sure as heck is complicated and we might unpack some of that in a moment. Uh, and the, um, the three girls who lead this will tell you a thousand times that they had uh, colleagues coming to them and saying, you know, we're on our knees, we, we need to do this a better way. Uh, there's nothing more exhausting than teaching disengaged children. You know, it's just really hard. Um, and they started, as many others around the world have done too, with the learning. They said, what are the learning experiences we want to see here? And we've seen that walking around. We've seen, you know, fabulously children working in pairs. I haven't seen a disengaged child all morning. I haven't seen a child who moved their body between me and their work because they were embarrassed. Every child I approached wanted to show me what they were doing with a look of pride and esteem on their face. The kids are loving their learning. It's multifaceted, they're working. You know, I was talking to a couple of, of girls. One of them was doing a project on planets. The girl next door was a couple of years older than her, had finished the science project, had come down to see if she could help and was giving some really good support. That sense of by children, for children, leading children who are loving their learning is palpable everywhere. But you don't get that without the tiny detail. So. Although the staff, I, I, had, I didn't see a teacher in the whole morning project their voice more than two and a half to three metres. They were always working with the children around them. And yet the children over there knew they were going to be visited, knew the teacher was going to be the audience for their work, knew where they could get help if they were stuck. You know, the, the teachers were omnipresent, but they were just focusing on one thing at a time. The kids were helping each other. Now, you don't get that without carefully thinking about the island. My eye wants to be able to see what's he doing over there. You know, you don't see that without children who are aware of the eyes on them. We walk around a cohort of, I don't know, must have been 20 or more of us. We were, we were completely ignored. I mean, the kids were getting on with their work because they're used to movement. If they're sitting in a window that's too sunny, they get up and move out of the sun rather than, I wish my desk wasn't in the sunny seat, you know. They're taking charge of their own learning lives, and that really shows. But it only works because the teachers know how to make it work. The building allows it to work, and the furniture and fitments are diverse enough to allow that variety. It's really, really complex, but it ain't hard. <laughs> It's always, you know, you walk into a room with 90 children and they're, you know, they're doing a number of different things. You have to stand back and people watch to see what's going on. You realize that the children are very clear about the tasks that they're doing a group standing on tiered seating. Now tiered seating is usually for that plenary moment when you bring the children together. You, know, you still need direct instruction. Teachers have still got things that contribute knowledge to pass on. But that, that was passed and now the children are standing on it they were doing a spiral test, you know, Leonardo's rotating parachute, interesting physics, a little bit of folding, some good maths, and maybe you, so they're multi-using the furniture, but they're not, it's not the 60s, it's not, hey, I'm gonna sit up here and dream a bit. If I'm over here with this task, I'm doing these things, a teacher will expect to see this finish. And I'm, you know, I'm obsessed enough to, to turn the pages on the exercise book and to quiz them about their work. The quality of the work is outstanding, is outstanding, you know, and because they've got many audiences, there's nothing more private 
with an exercise book that nobody sees. I can get away with lazy days and coasting days. And, but here in this big space where everybody's got a role and everybody's my audience, it moves on. However, having said all that, the children were making use of the space very cleverly. We walked past a bit where there were three boys using a tablet. They'd sat in a corner, they'd use the water pipe. This is an old Victorian building. They'd use the water type to prop up the tablet. They were gathered around having a serious conversation. Now, nobody designed the water pipe as a tablet, <laughs> uh, you know, display gadget. The kids knew what they wanted. They found a way to make the building work. So this is learner-led as well as teacher-inspired. And by gosh, it works. I go into a lot of schools. Um, one of the joys of my job actually is, you know, I get to work with a lot of children and have a lot of fun. And of course, you know, you're looking for eyes that burn bright, you know. And, and yet when you sit down with them, they're burning bright because of the learning they're doing. They're engaged in it. This little girl couldn't wait, could not wait to tell me about Neptune and all the things she knew about Neptune. And she's full of it, absolutely full of it. And that burning bright eyes, you know, that's the thing you look for. But you also look for the quiet bubble of learning. And I had my decibel meter out. Those big rooms with nearly a hundred kids in, we never saw 70 decibels. You know, we were in the mid to high sixties at the most. And that was when the 20 of us adults were all being too noisy talking to each other. So they had to raise their game a little bit. There's no um, hiding place for results. Kids are going to go out and they're, they're going to go on to other schools. Their results matter. They've got to be able to read. They've got to be able to do good numeracy. They've got to love science. Um, and when you have the children engaged, those are byproducts of good learning. They're not the focus of good learning. You get, you get kids who love number because number is an important part of their play activities, their science, their everyday life. So when I walk around the classroom, I see the things well, actually, maybe the old HMIs used to see in the in the olden days. You know, you know, I see the collegiality, mutuality. I see the peer support. I see kids on task. I see kids who are proud of what they've done. I see quality display work, and of course, I see good numbers and good results. But if you only look for the good numbers and good results, you can get that without engaging the children in very mechanical ways but the children don't go on then to love learning and to love ingenuity and problem solving. So it's a real challenge, I think, for Ofsted in particular, who are now saying, show us a broader curriculum. I mean, here is the embodiment of a broader curriculum and a big part of the curriculum is metacognition. How can I learn better? How can I do my learning better? So I think it's a big challenge for Ofsted, I think, to think about you know, what are the KPIs, what are the measurements that allow us to celebrate the excellence here on top of the outstanding results they've already got. Outstanding results aren't, aren't enough on their own. You've got to have the other bits too. They have here, a lot of schools haven't. I get, um, I get asked a lot, what's your advice then, Stephen? You know, and particularly on radio programs, what are the three top things? You know? And of course the answer really is, it's flipping complicated. Um, so it's going to take time. And, you know, they, they, they did a room, looked at it, evaluated it, did another floor, made it better, went back to the first one, tweaked it a bit, did a third one. Process of comps in iteration. You don't just build it and say, right, done, sorted, you know, best school in the world. Let's put, you know, it's a, you're constantly evolving. If you were building the best Formula One car in the world, you don't say, that's it, built. Lewis, here's your car for the next decade, mate, good luck. You know, every time you turn up for a race, it's a little bit better. And um, the same here. And of course, that would be an exhausting thing for teachers if they didn't have an army of smart intellects helping them. And those are the children. You know, there's not a child in Britain, not a child in the world. Go to refugee war zones, go to anywhere you like. Kids love learning and want to make their learning better. So the act of asking them, you get, of course, some good ideas. There's hundreds of them. They're bound to have some good ideas. 
you get, because they research, you get that metacognition, that reflection. Hang on a minute, that's how they're doing it in Denmark. I remember when we were doing, when we were running Teachers TV, we had over a quarter of a million children watching programs about how to teach every holiday. And they go into their schools and say, sir, have you seen how they teach maths in Denmark? Actually, would you see how they, <laughs> please watch the program. You know, kids do the research and they want to be part of it. But the really good thing you get at the end is that constant questioning of how can I do my learning better? And that's what you saw walking around here. Kids interpreting the challenge of doing the learning as well as they can, being the best they could possibly be. They were interpreting it every minute, every room, every space, and the teachers were giving them space to do it. So it's really hard for a teacher to trust the learners. But as some of my teachers said in Spain, when finally after a year, they started really believing that the kids should be leading this, they said, you know what? If it ain't learner led, it's not even worth starting. And that's the key bit of advice. Start with the kids, engage them, do it together. You can't build better learning for kids, you sure as hell can build better learning with them.